second session for IoT and apps. Um, this is Ballwinder from AppDynamics. She's an IoT architect, um, really brilliant lady, and hope you enjoy her talk. Thank you. So hello everybody, how are we doing today? Good. Yeah, and um, since oh, we have been there not too many people, would you like to come in front? Maybe we can have a better conversation rather than uh, me just talking. Yeah, okay, maybe not. Um, yeah, good, thank you, <laughs> thanks so much. So uh, what's the background here? Are people mostly from the embedded side? Are we from the enterprise side? Embedded? No? Yeah. yeah. Enterprise? Enterprise yeah, so the back end, like mostly cloud services and stuff like that. Okay. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, device response times. And one of the things that we find is a risk, but right now is not on people's radars as they build and uh, deploy IoT solutions. So is anybody monitoring, uh, actually involved in monitoring an IoT solution that's deployed and customers are heavily using? Anybody about to deploy one sometime in future? Okay, hopefully you're going to be working on an IoT solution, and uh, uh, this is, might come useful then. So um, everything I'm going to talk here is uh, it's uh, nice language from legal, which basically says that we are not committing to anything on any roadmap. Um, and that about me. So my name is Balvinder Kaur. I have been uh, with AppDynamics for about uh, over a year now. Prior to that, I was at a company and I deployed an IoT video uh, development kit for the IoT market. I have a lot of uh, mobile experience. I have, uh, prior to that, some enterprise experience. So it gives me a unique perspective on different areas when you talk about an IoT solution because it's really traditional embedded devices now connecting to the cloud services. And there's a lot of conflict and friction as these two different worlds, which have stayed separate for decades, are now coming together, um, not only from a technology perspective, also sometimes from an organizational perspective. So basically why this talk? This talk is, like I mentioned, that as people are either building IoT solutions to deploy or have recently deployed um, a solution, there are some problems that come up. They're not necessarily on the radar as people before deployment, but once it goes into the field, things start, that these problems start bubbling up. So it's more to create awareness of something that's going to come and you know, help people plan for it, design for it, understand that if we have to provide a solution so that our, our um, solution is actually profitable, which is what all of us really want to do at the end of the day is make money, uh, then what does it take? So let's look at the ecosystem. The consumer has changed, right? Um, we are dealing with millennials, and this is really what the profile of today's consumer is. I actually wanted to put my teenage son's picture up there, but then I thought it would be wrong on multiple, uh, <laughs> the probably some corporate uh, uh, policy would get violated. Yeah, just so I, we, we just go with Willy Wonka from the chocolate factory. So what's with the millennials? And I probably have to go through all of them to get, OK. No, it doesn't like it. There. Now we have all of. Um, 
we have the animation working now. So basically, they're very short attention span uh, individuals, right? They're digital native. They have not grown. Uh, they are used to touch screens. They are used to digital everything being available at um, very impatient, right? Like if they if um, if anybody's hungry now, all you have to do is pop something into the microwave, two minutes, and you get it. You need information, you Google it. You don't even have to open a laptop anymore. You just do it from your smartphone. So they want everything now. Everything, they're just multitaskers, right? Um, there was one point where I caught one of my kids basically watching a movie, playing a game, and chatting with a friend all at the same time. I'm not sure how they do it, but that's what they expect. Gone are the days where you know you have to, if you want to take a cab in the, in the city, you basically wait there, wait for half hour. Now if Uber is four minutes late, it becomes a big deal, right? Talk about conversational uh, UX these days, right? Homework, geography homework is done by talking to Alexa. Where is this mountain? You know, I had to put a stop to that sixth grader doing homework that day, but that's what we are dealing with. These are the people who are go going to have the buying power, and they are the ones who are going to consume, consume your uh, uh, services that you provide. So response time expectation. At the turn of the century, 10 seconds was very normal. We all have lived through that where we you know, used to load a browser page, wait for the initial Amazon book catalog to come up, and then you put something in the uh, shopping cart. At, at around 2009, when mobile smartphones came into the market, we had our first Android and iOS, the uh, response time expectation was one second. At that time, people in one second, the typical user response feels like there is a slight delay, but you're still in control. But now, what users are expecting is close to a 0.1 second response time. And this is what companies, which are four leaders in the web experience, are trying to achieve. The, it seems very daunting, but the good news is that is the extent. Beyond a 0.1 second, anything lower than that, the human brain can't even process. right? So that is what we have to achieve. But that is where the industry is going. And once there are parts of a consumer's um, lifestyle that is, gets used to a 0.1 second, then it doesn't matter whether it is a uh, enterprise application or a consumer application. They will expect the same response times from wherever they are. To give an example, let's say there is a worker in a warehouse using a tablet to manage the inventory. If the response time on those tablets does not match the response time that their social media apps give them on their consumer side, it is going to be a problem. And the enterprise that can deliver the response times that on the enterprise side, that they're that people are used to on the consumer sites are the ones that are going to definitely uh, have an advantage. This was all on the consumer or the edge side. What is happening on the enterprise side? So again, turn of the century, 2005, this is more or less what enterprises used to look like. But now they look more like this. All the monolithic web applications have broken into microservices. Things are async. The complexity, so as things are becoming easier and easier for the consumer, right? You speak and you can place an order. You speak and you can get an Uber. The complexity for a technologist has dramatically, exponentially increased, right? And we fall into the bucket of dealing with that complexity. So what's becoming more complex? There are more access points now from that single browser that people were used to. Their services are fine-grained, right? Um, all the uh, DevOps leaders, right? They want to deploy because velocity is the greatest thing. But then that also makes things very 
uh, complex, right? You need to know dependency between services. You upgrade one service, and if you have not made sure that all the others um, who are impacted by your service have been informed about it, it causes friction and problems. There are more external services. I'll give you an example here. Let's say you have you upgraded um, from a traditional point of sale service to these fancy ones that everybody sees, and you can now write Android or iOS applications that get deployed on a point of sale system, right, where you're uh, providing apps for coupons for fine dining or a taxi service or a limo service. Well, great, but the payment system is still the one that the point of sale uses. So as an application developer for that point of sale system that I'm providing a very niche kind of application, I'm still dependent on the point of sale system's payment service. Now, if there is a problem there, I don't know. So we were talking to a, a customer once, and uh, they showed their diagram of what um, it was a car company. Uh, they showed a diagram of how uh, um, the consumer from within the car was initiating a request, and it went to their back end. But between that, there were so many black boxes that the uh, car owner did not have any control over. And if there were latencies at different places, they really didn't know where the problem was and how to mitigate it. So there are a lot more external services. Everything is extremely asynchronous now. And services are short-lived. right? If you've ever written a skill for an Amazon Echo, you know that uh, the functions, uh, the skills that you write, they just have a very short lifestyle, lifespan. So basically, long story short, both the front end and the back end are now extremely complex. And gone are the days where you, know, you could instrument a line of code and follow it through. There were three or four points, and if you could figure out where the problem was. Now, we need automated tools to basically make sure that our service is up and running. So uptime basically translates into money, right? You lose, you have a service that is very sluggish. Your consumers are going to go away. You have a service that is unpredictable. Sometimes it works fast, sometimes it doesn't. How many of us have gone to a new you know, shopping site and found out that you put something inside your cart, and then the thing spins there while you're trying to check out? You'll try one time, two time. After that, you'll never go back to that company again, and you'll revert to your favorite online store where you know it's very reliable and dependable. So launching an IoT uh, business what are the challenges? Basically, there's voluminous scale. It's highly distributed. And now we are talking cross organizations. I'll give you an example. Traditional embedded systems, they were tested. They never connected to the cloud, right? They were tested, and they were deployed. And the only time somebody actually from the company went to that was um, is you know somebody lodged a service request, and that also you talked to your service company. They had an SLA. Somebody showed up at the door after within 24 hours and fixed your uh, dishwasher or fixed uh, any other thing for which you had a service or your printer, right? Now these things are constantly talking to the cloud, and there is an impact. And I'll I'll bring up a couple of. Uh, uh, use cases to actually show uh, how devices' performance can impact the back end, and the back end's uh, performance can impact the end user uh, experience. So, as people begin launching an IoT solution, the foremost uh, concerns that come to people's mind are naturally security and interoperability. And this is last year's survey, the 2016 survey result from the IoT Eclipse Foundation. What happened is that after IoT solutions were deployed, the third problem that surfaced was performance, right? 
I actually only two days back um, pulled out the result of the 2017 uh, survey by the same organization. And while security still stays at the top, I was a little surprised to see that performance is now down at, I don't know, seventh or eighth place. And my read on this is not that the problem has gone away. It is that there are other problems which are bigger. So security, interoperability, and connectivity are still the top ones, and they're consuming all of people's attentions and bandwidth that this problem which exists has not still bubbled up to where it becomes you know, the most critical problem or something that needs a solution. I um, gave an almost similar talk at the Open IoT Summit, which is hosted by Linux Foundation. And there, the room was full um, of a lot of people who were, had basically deployed uh, the IoT solutions, and that was their frustration, right? That we have deployed this, people have put pieces of software that are talking to the cloud now, but they don't understand that we need to be able to monitor the performance. And if we don't keep it up, then it's a big problem. So now I'll start digging deeper that once we realize and we want to take action on solving this problem, that performance is a key thing for us to keep our business up and running, what are we looking for in a solution? So the KPI for success is the low MTTR, mean time to resolution. The performance index is on both sides, right? Like I mentioned earlier. If your devices go down because they're connected to the cloud, the cloud performance can get impacted, which means, let's take a, let's take a tangible example. Let's say you are doing, uh, you're connecting, you have a, um, one of those insurance uh, plans where you plug a dongle into your OBD2 port in your car, and it is connected to the web. Right? And now there is a problem in all your million of devices that are out there, which is causing, impacting the web service. Now, anybody who's accessing that web service from their mobile phone or their browser is also going to get impacted. So it is a ripple effect. The other, other flip side is your web service has got impacted for whatever reasons. That now impacts the experience from different kinds of endpoints. So let's, lay, let's take a look at uh, two use cases. This is the first one. She is, uh, Teresa is the director of an IT services company, and um, they provide inventory management services to a variety of clientele. People fulfill orders from the web or from the mobile, but they've decided to adopt IoT technology, and they deployed an RFID-based automated inventory management system where basically their customers now had RFID tags in their warehouses, and they had automated RFID readers, which were reading uh, the tags on the devices and automatically updating the backend so that the inventory was up to date in real time. But suddenly, she started seeing that the backend application became very sluggish, and there was an unexpected load on it. So while we have so much hype around um, IoT, I don't think Teresa is happy right now. Let's take a look at another um, use case. So this is the other side. She, the first example is of an IT personnel. And now we're going to talk of somebody in the operations team, right? So Ivan is head of operations at a white goods uh, factory. And they launched a connected washer dryer system where basically even remotely somebody can check on the status of their wash or they can actually start one if it is loaded. And they started getting complaints that their web, their panels uh, have become very unresponsive. So where can problems happen? On the device side, devices become unavailable. They can lose connectivity. They can lose power. Devices become unhealthy. There is a memory leak somewhere. 
you're running out of CPU. There is an, uh, let's say this could be um, a connected car where there are multiple apps and another app, not your own, is misbehaving and is bringing down the performance of your uh, system. There are network lags. You're in a place where there is spotty connectivity, you've lost connectivity, or just um, there is a problem at the back end. You now have third-party cloud services are in the picture, like I mentioned earlier, and there is an unpredictability because of that. And your own web services could also go down. Are there any questions at this time? OK. So let's take a little bit deeper look into the devices. Power is one, connectivity, the UI, somebody is, has a wrong sequence of UI, um, is pressing the wrong buttons. Mobility, you could lose coverage. And then the other uh, normal culprit, CPU, RAM, storage, and version mismatches, right? Uh, you upgraded the back end, but you forgot to upgrade um, your a front end and it is still connecting to a previous version of the API and somebody forgot that version one was still in use by certain devices in the field. Then there are a set of problems that happen from not from a single device but from an aggregation of uh, devices. There are three V's that get talked of. The volume of data that comes in, so how much is the total data that your back end now has to um, has to consume. The velocity of data, it may not be too much. It might be the same amount of data, but you get bursty data. So the velocity of data. The third one is the variety of data. You could have different kinds of devices are using different protocol stacks to report data back. You could have a set of uh, one product line using AMQP to um, send data back to the cloud. Another could be using MQTT. Third one could be using HTTP. And I think it's one should assume now that these environments are going to be are no longer going to be heterogeneous. They are going to be a hybrid um, a set of devices, protocols, and so the better and cleaner the interfaces are, the, the more chance of success there is. So we're definitely talking highly distributed environments and hybrid environments. And then this, of course, is um, uh, what I already talked about, that the user uh, response time expectations are becoming increasingly demanding. What does the poor mean time to resolution mean? How can that happen? So you had a problem in the field. Now you know about it. But what is the time it took for you to resolve the problem, right? So the first thing is there are trapped metrics. Let's take, let's take the example of a smart building uh, scenario, right? They have protocols and infrastructure in place uh, where the HVAC systems are able to collect data. The only problem is all the logs are now trapped on that box, and there is no easy way to get it out. The next thing that can impact MTTR is, OK, you were able to pull out logs, but you have one set of data from the network, one set of data from the device, and you are sitting there manually trying to correlate what happened where. So manual correlation can also um, add to the amount of time it takes to resolve a problem. Third is, OK, you are actually able to pull everything out automatically. You are able to correlate different parts of your system. But the remediation is manual, right? You don't have any automatic way. So there is no self-healing machine learning involved where you are able to actually heal the system by itself. And finally, you have everything in place, but just the organizational gap is so huge that the operation technology people are not having a conversation with the IT people, and there is still you know, friction on how they operate, how they think. So that's more a management uh, issue than a uh, technical perspective. But 
I thought it's good to uh, bring it up. So what are we really looking at? So we are looking at an end-to-end -end monitoring solution, which not only uh, tells us the availability of different parts of the system, whether they are the services or they are the end devices. It tells us how they are performing. We should be able to correlate the performance from different systems, from different parts of the system. And then, of course, you should be able to have at least some tools to remediate it automatically. We do, I don't think we expect everything to get remediated automatically. Um, and then finally, you should be able to run analysis on it and you know, come up with the future be best practices. So this looks like a good end-to-end -end, uh, monitoring solution. So device-side instrumentation. There are two kinds of data that we would be capturing from these embedded devices. One are what is called device metrics. So think of it um, as uh, a static and dynamic data, of a, and it's a combination of your device and the application that is running on your device. Device, what is the hardware number, uh, what is the hardware version, what is the model, make, how much CPU do you have um, from the application, what is the application version number, um, and then you have the dynamic dat uh, data, what is my power level at this time, how much CPU am I consuming, what is the memory, what is the state of my application, other application configuration things which are best known only to the developer. Then there are events that happen. Let's take the example of a um, smart connected shelf in a retail store, where basically uh, the shelf, um, think of it as your grocery store, right? And it's a smart shelf. It not only detects the customer. If you have a mobile app, it can detect who you are. It has a smart display where it, the uh, price of the item can get updated automatically, depending on what campaign is running. Uh, if an item is picked from the device, the inventory system gets updated. Uh, and if the shelf is empty, or maybe there are two items left, right? it can sense that with sensors and is able to place, an, uh, place the order to, for the shelf to get replenished. So now there are device events that have happened. A customer is detected is one event, right? An item was picked is another event. The shelf is about to run out of inventory is a third event. So those kind of events will also get reported back to the back end. And so you're looking for device side instrumentation when we want to get real time performance metrics. We need to capture both the device metrics as well as uh, device events. Now, if you're looking at an enterprise-grade performance monitoring solution, there are other uh, things at play here. One is the ability to instrument all kinds of applications. If you're looking at a solution, you should be able to instrument your tiny embedded systems, your big servers, your mobile app, your browser app. So wide variety of devices. Also, wide variety of languages that are supported, because different applications get written in different languages. So support for Python, Java, .NET, all those kinds. So that is the second criteria to think about. Then you should be able to aggregate all your data at scale. After the data is aggregated, can the solution correlate different parts of the system? And all of that being said, it seems very simplistic, but it's really crucial if all the information that is coming in is not in a single pane of view. Just imagine for the person who has to monitor and keep the um, systems up, to, or the team that has to keep the system up 24 by 7, if they have to constantly move between monitors and between tabs, versus being able to customize and see everything they know, whether it is the health of their backend service or the health of their um, embedded application or their mobile application on a single pane uh, view. Then deep instrumentation, right? 
You could have a problem that's at the application level, but what if the problem was not at the application? What if the problem was in the database, right? There was a problem there. What if the database was also fine, but the problem was in the network layer, right? There was a network packet latency that happened. A carrier had, there was a problem with their carrier of the ISP. So being able to do deep instrumentation into different parts of your system is also a very important um, factor. And then naturally, something that we all want is diagnose problems quickly, provide health rules, alert mechanisms. And as the number of these uh, number increases in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of devices on the edge side, as well as from you know tens or hundreds of applications to thousands of microservices, being able to provide customize and see what you need to see. So provide alert mechanisms that are useful for you. And then finally, measure the business impact, right? What does it mean to my business? If, uh, if there are five smart shelves that were out of sync, what did it mean? How much money did I lose, right? Um, is there a way for you to be able to correlate the performance data of your entire system and translate into it into a business value, which makes sense to the business teams, not just the technical or operational teams. That's a big added plus. So let's go back to our two examples and see how Teresa and Ivan are doing. So the problem with the uh, Teresa solution was that the RFID system that they had deployed was updating the GPS coordinates every minute whether the value had changed or not. And that was causing an un, uh, expected, un, um, unexpected load on the back end. And so they just provided an, they did an OTA, uh, OTA update to the RFID reader and the problem was solved. And yeah, if you've ever tried to Google for the same person, unhappy and happy, it doesn't happen. So you take the same picture and stick a smiley on top of it. Ivan's problem. So basically the problem was that the washer dryers had unresponsive panels. So what happened was the HTTP endpoint was upgraded and nobody told the device team. And so they were out of sync. So same versioning problem that I mentioned earlier. And then the web service team basically rolled back their change until all the endpoints were able to consume it. And now we have happy, happy Ivan too. So best practices, basically runtime performance, and one of our customers actually mentioned this once, was that runtime, think of runtime performance instrumentation that the hooks that you provide within your devices, don't think of it as a debug tool, think of it as a feature that you are providing. And that is a very, very true statement. So don't think of it as a luxury that you would add it when you need it. It should be thought about it. Just how they say, you know, security needs to be built in right from design time. Same way, performance indicator hooks need to be built into your system right from design time. Then what kind of a budget do you uh, have to allocate, uh, especially on the embedded side or even the other side? 5% overhead is a good estimate. So um, especially on the embedded side, people do a lot of budget calculations of, you know, this feature is going to cost me this much uh, CPU and C uh, this much memory. So think of it as it's a 5% overhead to deploy that feature. How do you choose an agent? Basically, uh, the choices of an agent for on the web side are very different than those on the embedded side. The website you're looking for, there are these machines are big, you're looking for things that can do auto instrumentation, the Java runtime, the .NET runtime provide hooks where you don't have to instrument any code, you just have to deploy it at runtime and then auto instrumentation happens where they basically insert themselves in all the network calls that go out, they're able to read data, they're able to break it down and display a nice stack of where, they, where the problem is. So they're able to link without 
instrumenting, physically instrumenting no development effort. The same thing is not true on the agent side, right? Here, the developers and the device owners want completely configurable um, uh, agents should be able to control when I'm sending my data, when I'm not, small footprint, of course, naturally secure, um, collect and send crash data. I think I've gone over this best practices for IoT cloud service. Then the other thing is that uh, some of the things uh, for um, some of the features are different between a web agent and an embedded agent. The message payload format, application layer, what are the protocols? Uh, the gentleman before me was also talking about MQTT and AMQP. So what is the security layer? So just make sure that your agents, when you pick them, are supporting the kind of uh, um, uh, protocols and app, uh, uh, formats that you're looking for. We've gone over this as well. And uh, that's it for me. So questions, comments, feedback? Do we have any questions from anyone in the crowd? No, everybody's waiting for tea, cookies. Is there something, a break after this? Yeah, it's a little bit. Oh. Well, thank you. Cool.